One of the things we love about EIGRP is that it tries to be very conservative in its communications. It doesn't just blast out all the network information that it knows to its neighbors every 30 seconds. Instead, it has a successor route that's the preferred route to a network, and in standby, hopefully, we have a feasible successor. So if the successor route goes down, we can just immediately switch over to that feasible successor route, However, there are times where there is no feasible successor route. In that case, an EIGRP speaking router, it does need to send out a query message. Take a look at this example. Let's take a look at network 192.168.1.0 and let's say that that network goes down. It becomes unavailable. Now, you'll notice that this is not a transit network. We're not going through that network to get to another router. We just have maybe some end users, maybe a lab hanging off of that one router interface. So it's not that we lost a neighborship, but this interface, this network did become unavailable. And R1, because there is no other path to that network, R1 does not have a feasible successor route. So what does a router do when it has no feasible successor route and its successor becomes unavailable? It goes active for that route. It's actively trying to find another way to get to that network. And here's what it does when it goes active. It sends out a query message to its neighbors. Now, in this case, we just have one neighbor, it's R2. It would not send a query message out of the interface that went down, but all of the other interfaces that contain EIGRP neighbors, we would send a query message out of those interfaces. And we're asking R2, hey, do you know a way to get to the 192.168.1.0/24 network? And R2 says, uh, actually, no, I used to get there through you. So R2 is now gonna go active for that route. And R2 is going to send query messages to its neighbors. Now, by the way, if R2 had known about a way to get to that network, it would have sent a reply back up to R1 and uh, no problem. That reply would have satisfied R1 and we would have been converged. However, R2 did not know an alternate way to get there. So we're querying routers R3 and R4. They don't know how to get there. They're gonna send out query messages to their neighbors. Now at this point, there are no other neighbors to query. Oh, by the way, while this querying is going on, R1 is just sitting up here waiting and waiting because R2 did not proactively say, hang on, let me go check. No, R1 is just saying, I'm still waiting, still waiting. Now, what's gonna happen here, because there are no other neighbors to query, we're gonna send back replies from these neighbors at the bottom of the screen, and we're gonna say, sorry, don't know how to get to this network. And that's gonna go up to R3 and R4, that's gonna go to R2, and finally, R2 is gonna send a reply up to R1 saying, sorry, we don't know how to get to that network. That's the way things work, and I want you to notice something. We had this one network go down, and we flooded traffic through our entire EIGRP network. That was a lot of traffic for this one interface going down. Later on in this module, we'll talk about how we can better limit or how we can scope how far these query messages go. Let's take this another step, though. And this used to be a bigger problem back in the old days. And by the old days, I'm talking about somewhere around Cisco iOS 12.1 and earlier. Here's the way things used to work. Let's go through the scenario again. Let's say that again, this link fails and R1 queries R2, R2 queries R3 and R4. They're going to query these bottom routers. They don't know how to get to this network, so they're going to send the replies up to R3 and R4. However, in this case, R4's packet, its reply, it gets dropped. Maybe there was congestion on the network, maybe we've got a unidirectional link, who knows. But for some reason, this reply packet got dropped. Now remember, R2 is still active for this route. R1 is still active for this route. They have these internal clocks going, they're gonna wait three minutes. And if they don't hear a reply from their neighbor within three minutes, they're going to consider that neighbor to be down. So if R2 doesn't hear a reply from R4 within three minutes, it's going to say, I don't think you're there anymore. And it's going to cut off communication and we'll lose all the routes via R4. Here's what's worse than that. R2 has not yet replied to R1 because R2 has not received all of its replies. So at least for a time, here's the really bad thing that could happen or it could used to happen back in the old days, R1 
After three minutes, it did not get a reply from R2 because R2 is still waiting. R1's going to say, I don't think you're there anymore. And it cuts off communication. It breaks the neighborship. And R1 loses all of these routes that it used to get to via R2. That's the way things worked. Again, it was around Cisco IOS 12.1 and earlier. It's a lot better these days. That was a condition, by the way, that was called SIA, stuck inactive. We went active for a route and we stayed active. We never came out of that active state. We were stuck inactive. And today, Cisco is kind of built in a safeguard for that. Let's go through the scenario one more time. The link goes down. R1 is going to send a query message down to R2. R2 is going to send out query messages to R3 and R4. They're going to send out their messages just like before. Here come the replies back up from routers R5, R6, R7, R8. Again, we're dropping the packet going from R4 to R2. But this time, even though we've got these three minute timers by default that are set, this time, what R2 is going to do, it's going to wait 90 seconds and R1 is going to wait 90 seconds and after 90 seconds they're going to say uh, excuse me I sent you a query but I've not heard a reply yet now I need to know have I not heard a reply from you because you're waiting on a reply yourself or are you genuinely down and if we're really down, if we don't receive another reply, maybe it's a good thing to cut off that neighborship. So here's what happens. R1 and R2, they both send a stuck inactive or an SIA query saying, are you really there? It's been 90 seconds. I haven't heard from you. Now, in the case of R1, R2 is going to respond back and say, with an SIA reply, it's going to say, yes, actually, I am still here. I'm just waiting on a reply myself. So in a case like that, R1 is not going to break its neighborship with R2. And maybe R2 even hears a reply back from R4, if R4 really is there. If R4 was not there, then maybe it's an okay thing to break the neighborship between R2 and R4 because R4 is no longer connected. However, in this condition, that would not break the neighborship between R1 and R2. They would remain neighbors because R2 had responded with an SIA, a stuck in active reply saying, hey, I'm still here. I'm just waiting on a reply myself. So to sum up what we've said in this video, we said that if an EIGRP speaking router loses the successor route that it's using to get to a network and it has no feasible successor route that it can just immediately fail over to, it's going to send out a query message to its neighbors. And those neighbors, they can respond back with a reply if they have another way, a loop-free way to get to that network. But if they don't, they're going to send out a query message of their own. And in a really large enterprise network, this could get out of hand. We might want to limit the scope of these query messages. And we talked about in older versions of Cisco IOS, it was easier to get stuck in active than it is today because today with modern Cisco IOS, after half of that three minute interval has elapsed, after 90 seconds, our routers are going to say, hey, are you still there? We send out an SIA query and if we get a reply, we don't break that neighborship.